it's truly a pleasure to be here, and it's always interesting to follow my friend Pradeep, uh, who is the leader of my alma mater, UC San Diego. Uh, but there are some real distinctions between UC San Diego and UC Santa Cruz. And um, those distinctions are, are reflected by the fact that UC San Diego started in 1960 as a graduate institution. UC Santa Cruz started in 1965 as an undergraduate institution. And there's some really interesting distinctions that come out as a result of that. But you'll hear a number of similarities as well. Uh, UC Santa Cruz is doing remarkably well. Um, Times Higher Education consistently ranks us among the top 10 young universities in the world. And we, we also draw top marks consistently in terms of research impact, citations per paper by our faculty. So we're doing some really good things, even though we're only 48 years old as a campus. And I believe that it's our commitment to a liberal undergraduate education that really has been central to our success. So let me tell you the story, and I want to really break it down into three parts. First, I'll present some of the background about UC Santa Cruz. Secondly, I'll share some stories of areas where we've developed uh, areas of expertise. And I'll conclude with some lessons learned and best practices, which hopefully will be a benefit to other universities. So let me begin from the beginning. Uh, UC Santa Cruz is a part of the 10 campus University of California system that includes UC San Diego. Um, we are one of the youngest, having opened in 1965. I would say that collectively, the University of California is truly um, one of the, is truly the greatest public research university system in the world. And one of the reasons that UC was able to do that was building off the success of the first campus, UC Berkeley, and, and, and because of the California Master Plan for Higher Education, which allocated ten, uh, the UC system to be the research universities that do research and that offer PhD degrees, but designated the California State University system to be the, under, you know, the place where uh, the vast majority of undergraduates get their degree, a less selective system but a system that nevertheless produces a large number of degrees in California, and all fed by the California community colleges, of which there are more than 120 community colleges, whose role is to provide education for the first two years of college. And um, that's really worked remarkably well over the years, uh, and it's allowed us to specialize and produce quality. At the core, um, UC's mission is teaching, research, and public service. And we are steeped as, as a system in the liberal arts tradition. And I think the key point is the one that Pradeep made so eloquently, namely that we teach our students not what to think, but how to think, how to think, and how to think critically. And that's the thing that we're most concerned about uh, as we educate our students. So um, let me turn back now to UC Santa Cruz itself. And um, we are located in a rather nice location, uh, 2,000 acres overlooking the shores of Monterey Bay uh, and the Pacific Ocean. And most of our campus remains open, undeveloped space. We're consistently ranked one of the most beautiful campuses in the country with towering redwood trees and expansive meadows and architecture that reflects that, uh, uh, those facilities. We currently have about 15,000 undergraduate students and about 1,500 graduate students. Um, and much like, uh, it's, it's kind of ironic because uh, uh, you, you're hearing this morning three talks from three American universities that have undergraduate colleges. And if you're not familiar with the American system, you might think that this is just the way things are organized. Not at all. You are actually hearing from three, unit, three of the unique universities in, in the United States that have really developed a well-developed college system. Our college system at UC Santa Cruz is a little bit different than UC San Diego. Our colleges are smaller, typically around 1,500 students each. We have 10 undergraduate colleges. And they reflect part of, a part of the vision of our founders to create a, 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 an experience for our incoming students so that they could share a living learning experience. So our students take a core uh, course in each of the colleges that reflects some of the values of the colleges. Um, but they have, much like UC San Diego, uh, the opportunity 
to uh, be a part of a major research university. So it was our efforts, or our founders' efforts at the beginning to create what was the best of both worlds, the small collegiate experience, coupled with being a part and having the opportunities of a major research university. Um, they envisioned students you know, working side by side with researchers and scholars, and um, they also presumed a, a major ability to cross disciplinary lines, and I think that's actually worked. Today, our students are uh, reflecting the diversity of the state of California, um, both ethnically, socioeconomically, and racially. And for us, and I think it's actually true of most of the UC campuses, approximately half of our freshman students will be the first in their families to graduate from a four-year college. So that really does reflect uh, the kind of opportunity that a public university should be offering to our students. Our undergraduates routinely get opportunities that are traditionally reserved in many universities for graduate students. Uh, we encourage our undergraduates to be involved in research, to do independent work with faculty members. Um, they, and this focus on undergraduate research opportunities pays off because UC Santa Cruz produces one of the highest percentages of graduates in the UC system who go on to get doctoral degrees. Um, this is a consequence of the fact that more than 60% of our graduates, by the time they graduate, graduate, will have done research, original research with a faculty member. So that's kind of a snapshot overview of the, of the campus. I'd like to just briefly mention uh, three programs that we've, we've worked on to develop real areas of excellence because that's how we've developed our campus. One of these I can't help but mention is, is in astronomy, uh, both because of the organizers of this conference and because that happens to be in my own field as well, so I'm totally biased here. But um, we were fortunate as a campus when we opened to become the headquarters of the U uh, University of California Lick Observatory, which was the observatory of UC. But since then, uh, on our campus, we developed uh, the concept of a 10-meter of a telescope, which 20 years ago became the two Keck telescopes in Hawaii, which have been leading ground-based facilities uh, for all of astronomy around the world since then. And, our, and we've de developed a world-class astronomy department as a result that's revolutionized the design of telescopes and has really uh, been at the forefront of active research, both in terms of the discovery of new planets, uh, the development of, of, un of understanding of how structure formed in the universe, and the discovery of some of the earliest galaxies that have ever been formed. So that's the kind of research that, and research impact that puts a campus on the international map. Uh, you don't have to be great at everything, but you do need to have centers of excellence that can really do that. And the kind of unique facilities that we've developed actually invite uh, um, uh, international collaborations. One of the great things that the University of California system is doing now is we are developing a 30-meter telescope, which will be built in Hawaii and we'll see first light in 2021. And one of the, one of the partners, I mean, this, this started out as a partnership between UC and Caltech and is now includes several countries as partners, including India. So um, this is going to be a major international partnership. But one of the things we've done at UC Santa Cruz is taken it to the next step. We've also been uh, in, among the leaders in, in a subject called a uh, Astronomers hate the fact that uh, stars twinkle in the sky. I mean, there's a song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. It's very beautiful, but astronomers hate twinkling of little stars. So um, we have a Center for Adaptive Optics which developed techniques to basically take the twinkle out of the little star. And that has really been extremely successful. Uh, but we've even taken it further and used uh, that technology to develop microscopes that actually can, can probe into cells, uh, see individual chromosomes, and study individual chromosomes. And that's one of the key things, the kind of inter that allows you to take a subject matter in one field and really apply it to other fields as well. And um, that's what we've done with adaptive optics microscopes. Uh, 
Let me turn now to the second area that I wanted to emphasize, uh, because I, my point again is developing the importance of developing centers of excellence. And that has to do with the Human Genome Project and, and genomics. Um, when um, UC San, about when the, when the world uh, completed the Human Genome Project in the year 2000, what you may not know is that that project was actually completed at UC Santa Cruz. Um, laboratories all over the world were measuring little pieces of the genome. No one had figured out how to put those pieces together to create the final draft. And it was one of our computer scientists working with a biologist across disciplines that actually solved that problem. They completed the human genome, pro the first human genome. We put it up on our website and, um, and you know, we, we still show all of the new genomics information on our website. We get about three billion, uh, I'm sorry, we get about three million hits a week. Uh, on our on our genomics browser website, so that that's an example of a contribution that had global implications. Uh, but it's more than that. It's a it it's a gateway to the to to the new medicine and the new technologies in genomics. So currently, what we're working on is we, we well we were selected by the U.S. government as the repository for all genomics cancer data in the United States. And our faculty are now working to establish a global alliance to collect all cancer genomics data, which I think is ultimately going to re revolutionize uh, medicine. But that's a story for another day. Um, our genomics work uh, largely resides in our Baskin School of Engineering, which as a school of engineering is relatively young. It's only... Um, about 15 or so, or 15 or 16 years old. But what we did with our Baskin School of Engineering is we, we developed areas that were specifically, uh, uh, that we could, could specifically relate to our nearby Silicon Valley. We are about 30 miles from Silicon Valley. So we have strength in such fields as computer science, computer engineering, game, uh, computer gaming, uh, and uh, bioinformatics and biomolecular engineering. We concentrated on areas that we thought would be of particular interest to Silicon Valley, and that has stood us in good stead uh, since the very beginning. The third area I wanted to mention was marine sciences, because we're right on the ocean. Um, uh, we've developed strength in marine sciences, and of course UC San Diego has that as well in Scripps Institute. Um, but our marine campus overlooks Monterey Bay, and, um, and our scientists have really uh, been committed to protecting the world's environment. Um, we do pathbreaking work in collaboration with both the state and federal government, uh, various agencies, various nonprofits, in order to make a difference. And I want to give you one example because I think this is important. In 1999, the voters in the state of California, um, the voters in this, well, Oh, there we are. Voters in the state of California um, uh, wanted to protect ocean ecosystems. And so our marine scientists helped design a network of marine reserves, which now uh, are along the California coast. And those reserves are, are, are home to one of the largest conservation networks in the world. And as a result, marine life and habitat are rebounding in those marine reserves. So conservation is making a difference. And my main point is this is an example where scientists are working with public policymakers to create something that can actually further uh, the benefit of society. And I think that's a really important point when uh, scientists and public policymakers can work together. Now, I've talked about a number of ways in which we've used our location to um, uh, build top programs, but I want to emphasize that we have a number of initiatives in other areas other than science and engineering as well. And I want to talk about a, uh, just very briefly about a few that might be of particular interest to this audience. Um, one is that we have uh, earned global recognition for our visionary Satyajit Ray film study collection, which was organized by one of our professors, uh, Dalit Basu. Um, so we are at, we've actually restored RISE films. Uh, we have this world-class archive that is dedicated to the preservation and sharing of, uh, of RISE cinematic legacy. Um, a second example is our extraordinary program in classical Indian music. 
Uh, we established on our campus an Ali Akbar Khan endowment in 1999, followed by a, a, another endowment in classical Indian mu music a year later. Um, Khan himself was a member of our faculty, and his legacy continues to live on in, at UC Santa Cruz as a result of those efforts. And uh, a third one is our uh, South Asia Studies Initiative, uh, which is focused on India's role in the global uh, uh, economy, including its emergence as a source of managerial, scientific expertise and entrepreneurship and, in, and innovation. One of the thing, one of one aspect of that is that we have an annual lecture, the Maitra Lecture, uh, with speakers of the highest caliber, which bring to UC Santa Cruz an international perspective uh, that I think is very important. We've had speakers of the of the caliber of Amartya Sen, Vikram Seth, and uh, Sh uh, Shashi Tharoor uh, come and give Maitra lectures, so that uh, our students. Can of, uh, of, of this more global perspective. So I, I, these are examples of the kind of breadth of the liberal arts model that brings to, together physical sciences, engineering, and social sciences and humanities, which allows our students to emerge as leaders uh, in the new society. Um, so what does that mean for you, for India, for the idea of new universities here? I want to emphasize three points, three takeaway messages from our history. First, it's really important to build distinctive programs where research productivity of the faculty brings international recognition. It's better to have a few pockets of excellence. Well, whatever. <laughs> It's better to have a few pockets of excellence uh, rather than to try to uh, have across, you know, something across the board. Certainly it's better than across the board mediocrity. Second thing is that location matters. We had the advantage of taking advantage of our location. Our engineering school was developed with the idea of what was going on in Silicon Valley. Our marine sciences was based upon uh, our, our proximity to the ocean. Taking advantage of those geographic uh, uh, advantages is really a, a good thing to do. And the third is to be distinctive in what we offer to students. Um, that was the example of our colleges. Um, you heard a similar story from UC San Diego and of course Pomona College as well offer distinct programs that are very much atypical within the United States. But I think it's important uh, to empower our students to shape their own education. And I'll give a quick example of that. We have something called the Global Information Internship Program, which combines practical training in information technologies with theories about globalization, uh, networking, and social change. And our students share their computer skills with nonprofits and non governmental organizations all around the world. They're literally bridging the digital divide. And they, our students really love doing this because it speaks to their desire to make a contribution to society, to global society, and to make the world a better place. And so um, that's a student-initiated program, which has now become an established part of our curriculum in our sociology department. And that brings me to the final point I want to make, which is that um, a, global, a global perspective really matters. We really need to think of ourselves as a, a place in the world rather than a place in our locality. And that's really needed for our students as well because faculty wanted faculty collaborate, our students need it, and everyone benefits. So uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we could be talking about, um, but my take home message boils down to this. I, I think for the creation of new universities, particularly in India, be innovative, because innovation does pay off. And do things differently is a part of the pursuit of a vision. Um, you've heard different models here of different visions of how a uh, liberal arts college can operate. I think all successfully. Our founders knew that students would benefit from UCSE's unique approach. And that vision helped attract bright, creative faculty um, who think independently, collaborate across discipline, and really are an inspiration for our students. Um, their, their research and discoveries pushed the boundaries of knowledge 
uh, in important ways. So as you build your own academic traditions, as you develop your own models of liberal education, I encourage you to be bold, be daring, and don't feel beholding to conventional approaches. Thank you. Uh, it's a state-funded uh, university, as I can. It's part of the University of California system. Uh, what is the percentage of funding that a student who is domiciled, uh, whose state place of residence is California, get? And what uh, what is the difference uh, for those who come from elsewhere to study? Okay. Is it a kind of cross-subsidization model? Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to correct you. You know, we are, I'm not sure where I would say we're state funded anymore as a system. Uh, uh, right now, the University of California, all 10 campuses collect considerably more money in tuition from our students than we collect from the state of California. So we're now a state augmented uh, university system. And of course, my fear is that we will soon transition to a state tolerated university <laughs> system. Um, uh, at the University of California, our um, in-state students, students who are California residents, pay on the order of uh, uh, $13,000 a year. Uh, Non-residents pay uh, closer to $33,000 a year as undergraduates. So um, that's still less than most American private universities, but as you can tell, it's a whole lot more than what California resident students pay. particularly reminded me of uh, Indian bias towards building all universities, including all the new ones, in metros. You know, they're, all in, they're all in the giant metropolitan areas. There's a sort of thing that if you're rural, you are not part of the Indian educational system. There's a bias against it, which I admire the American uh, way. I'm from the frozen tundra of Northfield, Minnesota, so of course I have no <laughs> bias, uh, bias that way. But uh, I, I wonder if you could expand on any comments about that with the U.S. educational system and any advice or perspectives for the Indian system? It's, it's an interesting question because as an undergraduate student, I attended an urban university myself, and um, I could say it didn't do me any harm. But on the other hand, if you look at the University of California as an example, almost all of our undergraduate campuses were located kind of outside of major urban areas. Uh, even campuses that you associate with a big city, UC San Diego being an example, they were located uh, well away from downtown San Diego. And, and it's only after the campus was established that uh, um, air, you know, industry built up around the campus itself. I, I would suggest that for students there is some real advantage to being located away from their own comfort level. And that encourages students to reach out, to do new things, and, and really to form relationships with other students and with faculty. So I think there's a huge advantage to the non-urban, non-commuter uh, approach to education. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It just means it doesn't take full advantage of what's possible. Telescope, the telescope, the genome project, and the system that you have, the marine studies that you do. How are you relating all this research to the day-to-day -day study of a student in the college? So, uh, actually, we, how does this relate to our day-to-day -day, uh, edu uh, education of students in the college? Well, in several ways. One is, because we're a research university, our faculty actually do try to include recent research advances in their teaching in the classroom. Secondly, and I think this is really important, because we so strongly encourage our undergraduates to be involved in research projects, they have a real opportunity, once they've gotten to know a faculty member, to, uh, to do research under the supervision of a faculty member. And for, for our students, that's an eye-opening um, experience. It's, you know, when you actually do some research, even if it's a relatively small piece of research, to realize that suddenly you, you understand a little piece of the universe better than anyone else around in the world is really an, an important aspect of human growth. And uh, so our students benefit in that way as well. 
So thanks, George. Uh, I wanted to ask for the benefit of this group, really, a question about your rather unusual system of student assessment and evaluation, which is under some reconsideration, I understand, where everyone got the descriptive assessments in all their courses and so on, unlike uh, numerical or letter grades for the most part, right? So I wonder if you want to say a little bit about that and your experience with that. So it's interesting, because uh, actually we have changed. Um, UC Santa Cruz during its first roughly uh, 25 or 30 years of existence did not give, give grades to undergraduates. What we did was we gave narrative evaluations. That is, er at the end of every uh, term, a student would not receive a letter grade, but would rather receive a paragraph of description of how that student did. And um, around the year 2000, our faculty voted to change that system so that grades were required, although we also do give narrative evaluations on a voluntary basis in classes. So um, why, did that, why did we do that and why did it change? It's a really good question. Uh, we did it because we wanted to be a little bit unconventional and we thought that there, there was a lot more that could be conveyed about a student in a paragraph than could be conveyed in one letter. And if you actually go back and read the evaluations of students in, the, in that time period, it really was true. There was a lot of information that you could learn about a student just from reading these narrative evaluations. So why did we, if the system worked, why did we change it? Well, I, I would say two reasons. One reason was concern about whether or not it was disadvantaging students to, have, uh, to, to not have letter grades. My wife, for example, is a faculty member at a law school, Hastings College of the Law, and she told me that during that period, whenever they got an application from Santa Cruz, instead of reading the evaluations, what they would do is they would have uh, one of their secretaries read through the evaluations and assign a grade point average. And I don't think that was atypical of, of other places necessarily. The other reason is that it's very time consuming for faculty to actually do that. And so I think that as the faculty began to turn over and a new generation of faculty came in, they were asking a question about whether or not this was the best use of their time. So right now, we give letter grades as a default, but we give faculty the opportunity to also include a narrative evaluation, and some percentage of them do. But it was, it was a, I love, let me just finally say, I love that system because I never had students come and scream at me that they should have gotten two more points on the final exam because it didn't matter. Their narrative evaluation wouldn't have changed, but their grade might have changed. So I thought it was a great system, um, but nevertheless, you, you have to roll with the times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.